but other people are probably laughing at us and saying, what do you mean you're... The nice thing is the sun comes out, and it doesn't rain, and it's not cloudy and overcast, so that's the nice thing. And if you'd stand at just the right angle, you can get your back warmed up, you know? So we uh, had the father's that camping trip, and it was, it was a little chilly, to say the least. <laughs> and uh, we had a good time. I did anyway, but I always do when it's camping, so... Anyway, all right, 2 Timothy chapter number 3, if you will, and uh, we're down in verse 15, 16, and 17, and we're going to kind of camp here for the, the next several weeks uh, simply because of, of the, the subject matter that's here. Uh, verse uh, 15, let's just read the three verses, and then we'll uh, have some things to say about it here, okay? Okay. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse number 15, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And we come to these three verses in our 2 Timothy study, but we, we come really here to three verses that are very important when it comes to the authority and the source of the Word of God. And these verses are used uh, to, uh, by preachers and, and so forth, and rightfully used to prove and to identify the, the source and the authority of God's Word. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so we're going to kind of camp here a little bit. But first, before we get into that, verse 15, I said something last week about Timothy, and we had a couple questions, and I just want you to, I just kind of want to take a couple minutes and kind of clarify. When, when the verse says, and, and that from a child thou, he's talking to Timothy, has known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And again, the salvation is salvation from the apostasy that we're talking about in the passage. And again, you have to allow the context to define the word for you. Too often times we have a knee-jerk reaction about salvation. Paul tells the Philippians to work out your own salvation. And then people say, well, wait a minute, you say it's faith alone and no works. And Paul's saying, work it out. Well, that's two different contexts, okay? So you've got to be careful with that. Come back with me to Acts chapter 16. When Paul, when Paul tells Timothy that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, and then in 2 Timothy 1, he talks about his mother and his grandmother there and how that they, were, they brought Timothy up in the Holy Scriptures. In 1 Timothy 16, I'm sorry, Acts 16, here is where we see Timothy, verse 1. Then came he to Derbe, now that's Paul, and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, Timotheus. Now, Derbe and Lystra, Paul goes through the first time in Acts chapter number 13 and 14. 14, okay? So Paul has been through this territory once. He's now coming back again. And in him coming back again, he runs into Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek. That is critical to understand about Timothy. Timothy's mom was a Bible believer. Grandma was a Bible believer. But his dad was not. His dad more than likely was unsaved. Okay? Because the verse says, mom was a what? A believer. But his dad was a Greek. There's no indication in the verse that Timothy's dad was a saved man. However, what did he allow mom and grandma to do with Timothy? Teaching the scriptures. Okay? So as much as he's not a saved guy, he wasn't a louse of a guy. Now, watch verse 3. Him, um, verse 2, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go with, to go forth with him, and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, 
for they knew all that his father was a Jew. First of all, Timothy was not circumcised on the eighth day. Therefore, Timothy does not belong to the little flock and the circumcision believers. He's not a member of the little flock. Second of all, notice the focus on his dad by the Jews. Being, your mom being a Jew didn't mean anything. Your dad had to be the Jew. That's what meant something. Okay? Last week we were talking about who saved Christmas and the ladies and the daughters there, how they got the law loophole put in and the law and so forth, because the seed is through the male. It runs through the men. That's just how they did it. Uh, you know, people have, uh, ladies have a hard time with that, but, you know, some of it you have to just kind of understand the, how God set up the order in a family and the structure in the family. So, Paul, so Timothy, mom and grandmother are Jews. They belong to the little flock. They're Bible believers. Timothy is not, he, he's, he's their child. What did they hear when Paul came through Lystra and Derby the first time? I am now the, gen, the apostle to the Gentiles. What did mom and them recognize? They're Bible believers, so what do they recognize? There's Paul preaching the what? The Word of God. Timothy, let's go to Paul. You got to go to Paul, Tim. And they take Timothy to Paul. Follow that. So when you come here to 2 Timothy 3, that took five minutes, sorry. And he says, from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. The issue here isn't about Timothy. The issue is about the Holy Scriptures. All right? And I know last week I said about Timothy quickly and moved through. And when we started 1 Timothy, we spent a whole session on Timothy. But I just wanted to remind you of it because... When Paul is talking here, how do we defeat the men who are going to, the evil men who get worse and worse? Verse 10. I'm sorry, verse 13. How do we defeat them? We do verse 14. We continue in the sound doctrine and in the Holy Scriptures. We stay where we're supposed to be. Follow that. Okay? All right. Now, what's the, the context of verse 15, 16, and 17 sits in that issue there of. Evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse. They sit in the thing there of apostasy. That's their context. How are we going to defeat and get around and get over the issues of apostasy in the church, the body of Christ as a whole, specifically here at the local level, how we protect that? Well, we're going to do it by sticking with Paul, verse 14, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And we're also going to do it knowing, verse 16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So we're going to have to know two things, aren't we? We're going to have to know we have the Word of God for us today in an English language, in an English Bible, which is the King James Bible. And then we're going to have to take that book and study it, rightly divided dispensationally, and then stick with Paul. Follow that? If we lose this, we will never get that. If we lose this, we never had this. Okay? So it's critical here to understand some of this. And I'm not mad at anybody, but this is not something you just sit around the coffee pot and talk about. This is something that you, you, you got to get through and you got to understand. All Scripture, the, verse 15, 16, and 17 is a statement about the origin and the transmission of the Scriptures, the Bible. That's what we're talking about. We're going to spend the next couple weeks here doing this. Next year, we're going to have our seminars. And, and we're going to take a Saturday, and we're going to take three hours, one Saturday a month, I think, maybe, depends on how the schedule works. And we're going to dive into the details. Well, I'm not going to be able to give you the details here because you're going to roll your eyes back and glass over, okay? And I don't want to do that, but I'm going to give you enough information and then come on the seminars on Saturday, not this coming Saturday, I'll, we'll get the schedule out, Okay. And then we'll get into it and we'll get down into the nitty gritty of it because if you and I, members of the local church here, 
who understand the importance of what we're going to be looking at, do not understand the doctrine of inspiration and the doctrine of preservation, then we might as well sell the building, pay the bills off, close up shop, and go camping and fishing and hunting and whatever you like to do. Because if you can't say that you have a final authority, that when you come to a book, it is right every time, regardless of whether you're right or wrong, agree or disagree. If you can't say that, then you, again, we might as well close shop. Because if you, become, if you begin to get into human viewpoint, then you really just muddy the water really bad. And you know me long enough, we don't muddy the water if we don't have to, okay? Especially in this topic. All Scripture is given by inspiration. Notice it's all. Look, verse 16. It's not just some of it. It's what? All of it. So we're talking about more than Paul's epistles. We're talking about all of the Word. We're talking about all... By the way, notice it's all Scripture. Script. The stuff written down, okay, is given by inspiration. All of it. All the Word is valuable. Now, how you get the value out of it is you study it dispensationally. That's why you got A, you can have B. If you got B, you got to have A. If you miss up A, <laughs> one of those, you're not going to have the other. So it's critical to understand the doctrine of inspiration. That's verse 16. And the doctrine of preservation, that's verse 15. Because what does Paul, what does Timothy have? From a child, he has what? The Holy Scriptures. Timothy does not have the originals. He has a what? He's got a copy. Paul called that copy Timothy have Holy Scripture. The Holy Spirit calls that copy Timothy has what? Holy Scripture. See that? So when you begin to talk about inspiration... Come over with me to Job 32. Here is the only other place in Scripture that the word inspiration is used. Job 32. Usually when you talk about inspiration with people, you hear a common definition given of God breathed. That comes from the Greek word that's used to translate inspiration of theonoustos, which is theo, God, noustos, breathed. So God breathed. But it's much more than that, okay? Because God breathes, you know, just like you breathe. Boy, I tell you what, we're, high, we're camping and up there and you lose your, the cold takes your breath away. You get up time and <sighs> Mason goes, dude, you okay? I'm like, yeah, I just got to catch my breath. You know, I'm an old man, man. <laughs> you know? And he's like, well, you sound like my dad. I'm like, yeah, I know, I'm getting there, okay? <laughs> but uh, and we got other stories. I, that'll, Brian said it right, good preaching fodder, you know. The, co the common definition, God breathed, that leads to a question of, okay, what does that mean, God breathed? I mean, think about that. So let's get a better definition from the Scripture. I have books on the shelf back there. You can look at them. Don't take them, but uh, you, <laughs> all about inspiration, all about pre all this stuff. It's so much better to come to the Scripture itself and let the Scripture define it. One of the things we're going to do in our seminar is I'm going to show you the built-in dictionary in your, in your Bible. And we're going to take some things and some Scriptures and just run them and run through them and, and, and so you can get a definition out of it. Another thing I'm going to do, I'm thinking about doing, you know how we've been reading through the Bible and so forth? Well, we need to read through Paul's epistles. Keep doing that, okay? But there are phrases that we use in, in our English language that come right out of the King James Bible. And your King James Bible has more influence on the English language than any other piece of literature in history. You guys, uh, this past week was the 50th year of that moon, the, the photo of the earth rising thing, the guys up there back they had a thing on CNN. Late, if you watch CNN late in the afternoon, evening, they show you documentaries because they got nothing else to talk about. So I was watching them, and they have on there these guys, the astronauts. And you know what? They, have, they had a reading. They called it the reading. It was Genesis chapter number 1 from a King James Bible. 
So just in the last 50 years, look at the, the, the movement away from that. Because the man read, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And I was listening for the heavens, because that indicates a different version. And he didn't. So it's an interesting thing. Anyway, Job 32, look, if you will, at verse 7. <clears throat> Let's get the definition of inspiration here from Scripture this morning, and that'll set us up for the, the, the coming weeks. I said, days should speak, and multitudes of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in, in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Now, Elihu's talking here. He's been listening to Job and his three friends banner back and forth. And, and Elihu, basically what Elihu is saying in 7 and 8 is, those are my elders. I'm going to give them the respect and the benefit of the doubt. Okay? That's what he's saying there. They should speak and multitude of years should teach wisdom. Hey, they're my elders. They ought, to, they ought to know what's going on. They've been around a while. The inspiration of the Almighty, though, gives them what? Understanding. Inspiration of the Almighty. There's the only other place that word inspiration is used. Now drop over to chapter 33 and watch verse 3 and 4. My word shall be of the upright... Right, uh, rightness of my heart, and my lips shall utter knowledge clearly. The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. Isn't it interesting? You've got the inspiration of Almighty, and in the next chapter, the what? The breath of the Almighty. And what does the breath of the Almighty do in verse 4? It gives life. Now, if you think about that word, inspiration, in spiritation, literally what is happening in, um, come over to John 6, John chapter 6, in spiration, God has taken His Spirit and His spoken, breathed out some words, which His life, is contained in them. Does that make sense? He has spoken, breathed out some word. By the way, when you speak, you breathe. Some words that contain his life. So Jesus says, John 6, 63, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are what? Spirit, and they are life. Inspiration is the infusion of God's life into some words that He has spoken. Words in which the life of God is implanted in them, and then He speaks them out. Now in Scripture, there's three times that God breathes on somebody or something. The first one is in Genesis 2 when He breathes life into Adam. Okay? The second one, come over to Psalms 33. The second one is Ezekiel 37, when he breathes life into the valley of the dry bones. Psalms 33. Psalms 33. So the third one is here in Psalms 33. So you, every time the Lord breathes on somebody or something, what's he breathing out? Life. That's why, I, that's why I said the, it's the infusion of God's life into some words that he's speaking. Philippians, or Psalms 33, look at verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Isn't that interesting? What did he breathe? He, bre he, bre he, br he breathed life into creation, didn't he? When he said, let there be, and he said it, and the Spirit went, and they did it, and, they, and all that functions, what's going on there? Life came, didn't it? Come over to 2 Peter chapter 1. We're doing some Bible turning this morning, but that's okay. You, you've been off all week. I know you have. 
So, because we didn't meet Sunday, Tuesday night, or Wednesday night. <laughs> All right, so you can get your get the rust off. And New Year's isn't till Tuesday, and we'll be here Wednesday. So get the rust off, okay? Look at Second Peter one. Look at verse twenty one. For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Inspiration is God putting His life into some words that the Holy Ghost is coming come along and speak. And he's going to use some men to do it. Illustration, Acts chapter 1 and Acts 28. Get two passages, the beginning of Acts and the end of Acts. So when we talk about inspiration, we're not going to talk about it in the ivory tower and the theologians are off a doctrinal statement. By the way, if you read doctrinal statements and if you ever look at some of the old and the Westminster Confession and those guys, they, in the... 17th and 18th century, early 19th century were right on in inspiration and preservation. The 19th, late 19th century into the 20th century, they changed everything to say that the, uh, the Scripture is only in the originals. And they, they dumped preservation. And they did it trying to combat the Roman Catholic Church. Rather than standing what they knew was to be right, they cowtailed and caved to the Roman Catholic Church. Therefore, you have Roman Catholic sympathizing Protestants rather than standing their ground. And you see the doctrinal statements change. Even in gray circles, if you go to the BBF or the GGF, you read their doctrinal statements. I have them. We can pull them up on the Internet. You know what they all say? The Word of God was inspired in the original language. Period. Well, what about me today? You're going to find out in Scripture here, you have it for you today. And that was the way God ordained it, and God said it. You got Acts 1, that was all to give you a chance to get Acts 1. Acts 1, look at verse 16. Peter speaking, verse 15, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, verse 16, Men and brethren, this Scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus, and he quotes Psalm 41. Who spake? The Holy Ghost spoke. The Holy Ghost spoke some words through the mouth of David that then got written down, scripted out, Scripture. Who's doing the speaking? In Peter's estimation... It's the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, speaking by the mouth of David. That's who's doing the talking. Follow, see that? Come over to Acts 28, verse 25. Here's, Pete, here's Paul. Here's Paul. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah, and that's Isaiah, the prophet unto our fathers, saying, and they quote Isaiah Chapter 6. Who'd Paul say was doing the talking? Isaiah or the Holy Spirit? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. It's Acts 28, 25. So Paul and Peter, say they see the Scripture as God speaking it, breathing it by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the mechanism. And when God speaks it, now, 2 Timothy 3.16 says all Scripture, script, what is written down. So it's not just what God spoke by the Holy Spirit. That what God spoke by the Holy Spirit has His life in those words. But then He caused it all to be written down. So then the words written down have His what? His life in them. You follow? Am I making any sense at all? Or is it just too early and you need your coffee? Go to Matthew 4. Well, wake up. Let's go. <laughs> Snap out of it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I, I understand this is, you know, 
I'm trying not to be technical, but I'm trying to be technical with you. Because the inspiration is some, th- some words that God spoke that contain and have in them His life delivered by the Holy Spirit, given to man, given to David and Isaiah specifically. There are other passages. Now watch Matthew 4. Look at verse 4. But he answered and said, this is the Lord being tempted of the devil. He's hungry. The devil says, make these stones into bread. Verse 4, and he, that's the Lord, answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, now watch, that proceed out of the mouth of God. So it's very clear, isn't it? It's every word spoken. But not all of it's always written down. The words that were written down, the scripture, the script, all the words that God caused to be written down, they have his life and spirit in them. Come over to, you're in Matthew, come over to chapter 22. Chapter 22. Chapter 22 of Matthew, start in verse 29. You got Matthew 22? Run over to the end of John real quick. Let me just show you this. Uh, John 21. John 21, 25. Hold on to Matthew 22. Because not everything that God spoke is written down. And, and I, I just kind of illustrate that for you. Look at John 21, 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose, that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be given. You see that? Just as an illustration of that, everything the Lord did wasn't written down. If it did, what would have happened? That verse says it would have filled up the globe. See? So when I say every word that God spoke wasn't necessarily written down, that is the case. We have the what, though? We have the, writ- the things that he wanted written down. Go back to Matthew 22. Start in verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, and this is the Sadducees he's dealing with, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. So what are we going to be talking about? The Scriptures. We're going to be talking about the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Now watch verse 31. But as touching the resurrection of the dead... Have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying? That is probably the clearest definition of inspiration and preservation right there in one verse, verse 31. So when somebody pulls out a Yankee Doodle, hat, MD, PhD, THD, J.D., B.D., whatever he's got behind his name, this is what it is. Say, no, it's not. Matthew twenty two thirty one 31 tells me what it is. Look at what it says. Have ye not read that which was spoken? That which was spoken. Where do we find that? Have ye not read? You see that? Where do we find what God spoken? We find it in the Scripture. And when you read the words on the page, you're reading that which was spoken to you by God. Clear as mud, right? Now we can go get our coffee and donut, right? (laughs) Not really, not yet. (laughs) I'm going to massage this thing down a little bit more for you, okay? So when you talk about inspiration, what does the Scripture define it as? That which was spoken by God that contains His life and His Spirit in it. And its design is to give you life and to give you uh, his spirit and the working of his spirit. And this gets into the setup of man and how man works, and we did that real use study. All this gets intertwined. It's wonderful. Now, 
when Christ says this to these guys, are they able to go over to the library and pull out the original? No, not at all. What do they have? They have copies. And, by the way, this is a quote out of Exodus that he's quoting. They don't have Exodus. they got to go get the copy made. Jesus Christ doesn't have the originals in front of him, yet he calls the very copy that he's reading, what? That which ye have read, spoken. There, so there's the preservation issue. Now, come back to Isaiah 30. This is the passage last week I couldn't remember. <laughs> it's Isaiah 30 and verse number 8. And the reason it was written down, and the reasoning behind it, is Isaiah 30 and verse number 8. Now, in Isaiah 30, verse 8 here, by the way, the issue of preservation, we're not going to talk about this today, we'll get to it probably in our seminars a little bit more uh, in, in depth, because God has an ordained process of preservation. He has a system for it. He's got people to do it. In the Old Testament, I'll tell you, in the Old Testament, it's the issue of Israel, but it's the issue of the Levites. It was their job to preserve the Word of God. Do you know whose job it is today to preserve the Word of God? Ours. Unfortunately, we have left it to the church at large. So what are they doing? They're hitting a spell check button on the computer, and now it's not all way, it's all ways, when it should be all way. Now it's not thoroughly, it's throughly. Those are different. See, our job, as those who trust it and believe it, a man one time said, a preacher, and he's like, we cannot defend the King James Bible in the marketplace. Money is what talks. But where we promote the King James Bible is in the marketplace of ideas. We'll never make it on the marketplace out there in the, in the bookstore. Because there's no, the money is the drive. But we do it where? In the thoughts and the ideas. He said that. I took that home it's many years, 20 years ago. I was like, wow. I got to thinking about it. And he's right. We could set up a printing shop next door, $100,000 to do it. I think we ought to, personally. I think we ought to be doing it. If not for the church at large, but us specifically. Because I'm getting blind, so this little stuff, I got to get that big print, you know. You know how, I mean, just get the printing press running and let's go to it. But what happens then is, it's the financing of it. And that becomes then the motivation for doing something we ought to be doing without that, well, it's the money. I'll be honest with you. We'll talk about some of that in the seminars coming, because I got a, I have a personal bent towards some of that of our job here the local assembly, is to keep this book in print. That's our job, regardless of the cost. Now, the problem is, is we've let the Baptists do it. And there are great Baptist outfits that do it. And I'm glad they're there, because I'm able to buy Bibles from them. But the problem is, is well, the, not the problem. The thing is, is do they believe in a word rightly divided? No, they don't. So you, you see the toss-up. Anyway, get off. you got Isaiah 30, right? <laughs> Here's why it's written down, verse number 8. Now go, write it before them in a table. Note it in a book. All right, so what are you going to do, Isaiah? You're going to note it down. You're going to write what I'm telling you down. That it may be for the time to come forever and ever. That's a clear overview of how it's all to work. Inspiration and preservation. Isaiah, you, tell, you take what I'm telling you. You take my life, my spirit in these words that I'm giving you, and you go write them. You go script them in a book. For how long? For generation to generation. Forever. Now come back a chapter to chapter 29. So inspiration in Scripture isn't about the process. It's really about the product. Write it in a book. I'm going to speak it. I, we'll talk here in a minute about translations a little bit. We'll talk more about it coming next week. 
People all get all upset about translations. You know what the hardest translation is? From deity language to human language. That's the hardest translation job. And you know what God said? Not a problem. It is not a problem to translate from language to language. The hardest part was him putting his thoughts, his life, his spirit into a language, into a speech, into words that man can use and understand. That's why he uses human authors to, to, to write the book. You follow that? It's important. Look at 2918. We're going to write this thing down. It's going to be out there forever and ever. It's going to be preserved. 29, Isaiah 29, verse 18. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. That day is the millennial kingdom. That's what the whole issue here is talking about. And in the millennial kingdom, what's going to show up? The book, the, the words that Isaiah wrote down here, the book, the words, the scripture. They're not going to have to go hunt for it. They're not going to have to go over there and, 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 and dig around. And an event that is future of us. What are they going to do? They're going to have the book. Over there in the Hebrew epistles, uh, come over to Romans 16. They, he looks over there and he says, remember the patience of Job. How would they remember the patience of Job unless they had what? The book, the word of Job, the book of Job. They got Job, they read it, they go, up. Oh, there's the patience. Now we can get through this. Folks, Isaiah 29 is future of us. So if, when, by the way, Isaiah is written about 700 B.C. The millennial kingdom, well, it still hadn't come yet. You know what God has done? From the moment he wrote Isaiah, he has preserved it from generation to generation to generation, and he will continue to preserve it through because he's got a process, a system in place. So he's going to take care of business. Now, when you put the Scripture, look over at Romans 16. There's a, in verse 26, there's a part of this verse that we tend to just read or not even quote. We just keep moving because uh, we're looking after the other doctrines. When you, when, when you take Scripture and you put it into the languages of the nation, the nations out there, it is just as much the Word of God as it was in the original. Because the issue is the words. The life is in the words. Okay? Now look at Romans 16, 26. Verse 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. And by the scriptures of the prophets, now again, we usually stop right there. I want you to read the rest of that verse. The everlasting God, I'm, I'm sorry, and according to the commandment of the everlasting God. What would that be? Wouldn't that be his words? Made known to who? All nations. Does all the nations speak the same language? No. For the what? For the obedience of faith. You see that? Right there, you know what Paul says? My job is to translate and to move the scriptures that I have into other languages of all the nations out there. That's what I would have the body of Christ do, Paul said. You see, do you, do, I, you gotta catch that. And again, we read through that, but when, man, when you're talking about the obedience of the nations out there, how in the world can they be obedient unless they speak, unless they've got the word in their language? Okay? That's critical. Translating is not a problem, folks, when you start from the correct text, a textual issue. And again, that gets technical. We'll save all that for the seminar. But when you talk about translation, look, look over at Acts 22. Let me just give you an illustration of this. 
By the way, do you know that there is a great difference between Hebrew and Greek? In Hebrew, there are no verbs. You know that? In Greek, there, it's very verb-intensive. <laughs> there's tenses, there's, there's neuter, there's, there's gender, there's all this stuff. We don't talk about the Greek and the Hebrew. <laughs> we speak English. Some of you, we're going to show you here in a minute, you struggle with English. But look at Acts 22, verse 1. Brethren, men, brethren, fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the, what tongue? The Hebrew tongue. To them they kept the more silence, and he saith, now in Hebrew, Paul starts, verse 3, I'm of, and he goes. Who wrote Luke? Uh, who wrote Acts? Luke. <laughs> but what language did Luke write Acts in? Now, Paul's speaking in Hebrew. Luke is going to record it by the Holy Ghost, spake by the mouth of Luke. Is there a problem? It ain't a problem at all. Luke put into Greek everything Paul said in Hebrew, verbs included. And Hebrew doesn't have verbs. Because who was doing, who's instigating the issue? The Holy Ghost is. Have ye not read that which was spoken of you by God? See that? So come back to 2 Timothy 3. Translation is not a problem, folks. Translating is not, a, not an issue. You just have to understand what, what's going on you, you, when you go do it. You have to have a proper motivation for doing it. And when you read the American Bible Society and you read all these different groups out there that, that translate, there for a while, the California camp, we were meeting at the Wycliffe camp there in Idlewild and so forth. And, and I, in the Wycliffe group, they're, they're prolific in translating the Bible. Problem is, is they come from the wrong text. You got 2 Timothy 3? Run over to Hebrews. Sorry. Hebrews chapter 10. And, and when they do that, I mean, I'm impressed that they can do it, first of all. I have enough problems with English, if you haven't heard already this morning. You know, in a minute, I'm going to make up a couple words for you, okay? And that's okay. They just go in the RJ dictionary, and I'll help you out. But the thing is, is when you move with the improper motivation, that's why I said the Bible issue belongs to you and I, and keeping it prolific and keeping it in the marketplace of ideas, because what is our motivation? It isn't to get a big bank account. I hope not. It's to do what? Put the Word of God in the hands of the plowboy, as it was said. Now look at Hebrews 10. We're just going to jump in because I'm looking for something. I want you to see what the Lord says. Verse 7. Then said I, Lo, I come. Now watch the parenthesis. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. God the Son looks at God the Father and says, I'm coming to do your will because where was it? Why? Because it was written in the volume of the book that I come and do it. See that? So if you like other versions, and I run into people who do, I always read them verse 7. Because what would the volume of their book do? It would promote the Lord Jesus Christ, would it not? What should we be doing? Promoting the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. So then what book does that? The only one on the market is the King James Bible. You pull them out. I got a comparative Bible in there. They make Joseph his dad. They do away with the blood, the sacrifice of Calvary. They water it down. They diminish. They add, subtract. They, change. they even leave whole sections out that if you read it, doesn't make any sense. So when you come to the issue, come back to 2 Timothy 3. 
you come to the issue here, what we're going to be talking about, today I just want you to catch inspiration, okay? When, but it's important. It's critical. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, you see the is there. And I, I, we talked about this last week at the end, and we're just going to bring it up here just in brief because i got only got a few more minutes to get introduced into what we're going to look at next week, okay? The is is in italics, and there, there's, there, there's a lot of misunderstanding about italics, I think, because you don't always see it in everyday English. When you see it in the King James Bible, by the way, if you're online, your is will probably not be italics, okay? When you see it in the Scripture, a, that is a indication to you, the reader, that when the translators did the work out of the Greek or the Hebrew, to make English grammar work, they had to put that word in to make the structure work. You follow that? Okay. The passage back in Samuel where they say he slew the brother of Goliath, the brother of is in italics. Because if you pull that out, it says he slew Goliath. And we all know David is the one that slew Goliath, not this other guy. So your translators knew enough about their scriptures and what they were handling and what they were studying to protect it, and they slid that brother. Now the brother of is the word of God. That's what it is. The is is the Word of God as well. Now, when you don't understand the italics, and I'll be the first one, there's some of that I don't understand. Why, why in the world would you do that? We were talking the other day, and the two in the bed, and, it's, and, and the men is in there, and it's in italics. I don't know why they did it. I'll tell you. It's got to be a reason, because they just wouldn't have done it. So now i got to go back and break out the Greek to figure out is it a tense issue or what is? Yeah. And I'm just sitting there going, now I'm banging my head up there because I don't understand half of what, three quarters of what I'm, not half, three quarters of what I'm reading. So you know what I say? It's there, it's the Word of God. <laughs> I'm okay with it. We'll move on. All right? I'm sorry if you don't like that. I'm my apologies. But see, the issue here of the is, the is is, is, in, is in a present tense. All Scripture is given. So what people do, the critics, Bible critics do, is they say, since it's in a present tense, that inspiration is ongoing, and it is continuing. So when you hear someone say, I got a word from the Lord, you better write it down because that's inspiration coming. Now we're going to see that inspiration is done because the is here is a grammatical issue rather than a trying to teach you that inspiration is continuing. And the is here is, it, it is the historic present in grammar. The tenses have, come back over to Galatians chapter 2. This is the passage we used last week. I'll show you here. When you, when you, if you Google or Wikipedia or look up tenses, historic present is one of them, and that is that you take something from the past that's completed, you put it into the present tense to make it have an impact on the reader in the moment. Okay? That's what Paul's doing. By the way, that is what your translators were doing. All Scripture, it, 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 the Scripture's done. It's completed. When Paul puts his pen down at the end of 2 Timothy, it is finished. The completed revelation is finished. How do you know that? Well, you go read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We don't have time to do it this morning, but we will do it. And where he says, we know in part and we prophesy in part, but that which is fully, uh, that which is perfect come. Well, perfect what? Perfect knowledge, perfect information. And when that comes, then what's done? All that sign gift stuff stops. Because what do we have? Perfect, complete. It's not ongoing. It's done. Well, okay. So the is is a historical issue. So don't get mad. I'll just tell you this, when the italics come in and you read them, 
And I read them. I go, okay, what's going on? You know? Don't get mad at the translators for knowing about your, more about your English language than you do. So before you go jump on translating it into another language, learn your language. Right now, there is a King James Bible that has been translated over in Lithuania into that, lang- that dialect over there, and they use the King James Bible to do it. The whole book, all 66. I think it's all 66 books now. Now, I'm going to tell you what. Their Romans and your Romans ain't going to read the same. Because the language that they speak in Lithuania is not English. Have you ever read Spanish? And you look at it, and then you do a literal translation of it, and it is so backwards. Why is that? Because Spanish ain't English. It's structured different, grammar's different. So when you do, see, you got to, I tell you what, I'm not a linguistics, as you can tell, a linguist, sorry. <laughs> As you can tell, I can't even say the word, you know. But you got to pay attention. So don't get mad at the translators. That's my point. Get in there and study around, root around a little bit, and figure this, some of this out. Or trust it to be the Word of God and move on. Okay? Now the is. Look at Galatians 2. I showed you this one last time. This is the easiest one to see. Look at Galatians 2.21. When we talk about this is, the present, the historic present tense. Again, it's to make it vivid. It's to bring something that has happened into the present tense to make it real, to make it impactful. Look at verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Do you see that is? By the way, notice it's not in italics. That tells me the is over in 2 Timothy ought to be there, by the way. But that is Christ. Now, is Christ dead today? Not at all. He's alive. He was buried, rose again the third day, ascended into heaven, showed up and appeared to the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. He's alive. So then wait a minute. I've heard that that verse used to prove that that Christ is dead. Because what does it say? He says it's dead. But that's a historic present tense issue. Because he's not dead. If you want to frustrate the grace of God, go live under the law. If you live under the law, you're going to frustrate grace and you're going to end up saying that Christ died in vain. Okay? Now look at 3.1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth. Now watch this. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. There it is. When the Galatians heard Paul's gospel, it was just like they were there at Calvary. It was so real to them. That's the historic present. Okay? Now, go back to 2 Timothy 3. And I got five minutes, three minutes, four minutes, to set up what we're going to do next week. Inspiration. is God speaking some words that contain his life and his spirit in them that he then takes and has written down. And those words are as much, the written down words are as much as the word of God as the speaking part does. Okay? Now, there are four terms we're going to have to wrap our heads around as we go forward. The first term is the issue of revelation. We would never know God. We would never be able to relate to God unless God takes his thinking, revelation, his thinking, his communi- and communicates it to man. That's the issue of revelation. God takes his thinking and communicates it to man. He moves his deity thought into humanity thought. Revelation. Inspiration is then he takes that information... And he puts it to paper, gives it to man, puts it to paper. You with me? Revelation, God reveals himself, gives some information to man. Inspiration, man takes that, puts it to paper. Preservation is he takes the info that's now on the paper and through a multiplicity of copies, preserves it from generation to generation. And I say multiplicity of copies because there is sometimes when you get trouble, the British Bible... There's a he Bible. The printer 
messed up and left off the S on the she, some of the she, and every, everywhere it said she, it's he. So they call it the he Bible. Do you know how many Bibles of those are, exist? One. Because as soon as it was found, it was done, went in, they corrected it. and all. The Britches Bible, they got Adam and Eve putting pants on, britches, instead of a fig leaf. That's a printer. Printer does it. When you run into stuff in your Bible, if you, by the way, if you look through some of this on your own, you'll find printer where printers have adjusted stuff. Okay? That's not preservation. That's a printer doing it. Preservation. From gener- the, the fourth term, quickly, is translation. Revelation, God reveals himself, communicates it to man. Inspiration, he takes that information, puts it to paper. Preservation, we're going to preserve what's on the paper from generation to generation. And then the issue of translation. And that's when you take the preserved word and it goes from one language into another language. And we'll see that the scripture teaches what the scripture teaches us about translation is that it teaches us that a translation from Hebrew to Greek can be done in such a way that the Holy Spirit says that's the word of God right there in your lap. Now, those four terms allow us to be able to say that in the English language we have the perfect inerrant preserved Word of God in a King James Bible. How can you say that, understanding those four terms? So we're going to look at all, we're going to begin looking at those. You follow that? Now, all of that's coming out of 2 Timothy 3, 6, 15, 16, and 17 here. Yeah, whew, is right. Because we understand what the context is sitting in, but in that context, folks, if you don't have a Bible, a Scripture, that you can come to, when the times get rough, that's perfect, that has no errors in it. And I know people say, oh, there's an error back there. He said, blah, blah. yeah, just study it a little longer, and you'll find out, guess what? It's not an error. Horsemen and horses are two different things, aren't they? Will, will, will an army always have more horses than horsemen? I'm talking about Chronicles and Kings and some of the stuff. Back. The answer is yeah. But, you got, but people don't read that. They listen to some preacher on the TV or the radio say, hey, here's a mistake, boom, boom, boom. And then you go look at it and you go, no, that's two different, term, not two different terms, okay? If you don't have a book that you can rely on exclusively to be right every time you go to it, even when you agree or disagree with it, you will succumb to the apostasy. It will get you. And I will say that it probably already has you. Okay? All right. Again, I'm not upset with anybody. This is just information that gets the motor running. Okay? But it's information you need to know. You need to have a clear understanding of it. Inspiration is just simply God spoke some words that contain his life and his spirit in them. And they're designed to give you life. And they're designed to give you his spirit. And then we're going to write it down. So we're going to look at those four terms next time, okay? All right. Dear Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we just thank you for who we are in your Son. We thank you that we have your word that teaches us that. We can rely on it, and we can understand it, and we can rejoice in it. In your name we pray.